Welcome back to the Shot by Shot podcast. Today we're going to be talking about a film that is very personal to me. It's one of my all-time favorite films. And, uh, you know, I, I'm going to get very personal for a minute where, you know, there's there's films that I love to watch. There's films I find enjoyable, films I learn from. And you know, every now and then you get those really special films that change your perspective on what film can be and really just uh, hit on a very personal level where, they change the way you view the rest of the world when you leave that theater. And, you know, for me, this dates back to, you know, Star Wars is the movie that got me into it. And as I got older, there was Goodfellas. And Goodfellas really showcased to me what film could be and the possibilities of storytelling and how many different ways the story can be told. And there was La Dolce Vita, the film that really showed me what it means to be an artist and made me want to be an artist myself, not just an entertainer. And... Uh, a film that made me really take a deep look at my own life in a lot of ways. And then earlier this year, for the first time, I saw Chungking Express. And it was, you know, I saw this film at a time in my life when it was just the perfect time for me to see it. Because at the time, I just had certain things I was feeling and certain things that in my own life I wasn't thrilled about. And, you know, when I walked into Chungking Express, just the, the mood of the film from the very beginning of it, I think was just exactly, you know, what I needed to see in, at that point in my life. And, you know, movies are something that, you know, have always brought in, uh, joy and direction and passion into my life. And, you know, in those times when, you know, things aren't going as well, I often do look to movies and go to the movie theater. And Chung King Express was just one of those perfect matches for that, the way I felt at that time. I walked into the theater and Truly one of the most packed theaters I've ever seen in my life. It was a near complete sellout at the Philadelphia Film Center, which I don't know the exact number of how many it seats, but it's a gigantic theater. And for me to have to be in the front row of a theater that big because it's so crowded just says a lot about how many people wanted to see this film and the impact it's had on an American audience. And I think what Juan Kar Wai really understands as a filmmaker is just human emotion on such a deep level mainly love and heartbreak, but as a whole, I think his films are not very plot-driven and not very dialogue-driven, and I think that's part of what makes them so communal is that he knows that, you know, when you go back to silent film and you see the beginning of what film was, it was a very communal language with music and picture, which no matter what part of the world you're in, no matter what language you speak, it's something that all of us as humans can really understand, and Mon Karwai really leans on that. Which is why I think this film has traveled so much and touched so many people all around the world, which I think is a perfect example of, you know, what cinema should be and the importance of this art form. Because, you know, here I am, you know, at 24 years old at the time, sitting in a movie theater, watching this low budget shot in one month Hong Kong film from a guy on the complete other end of the world. And here I am sitting in a packed theater in the middle of Philadelphia and, you know, it's feeling, I'm feeling things in the movie, the movie's feeling things that, you know, I'm feeling at the time. And it's just touching me on such a deep level for something that was created in such a foreign culture from such a foreign style of making movies that I had never seen before. And I think that that right there is a, a perfect example of, you know, what cinema should be. Wong Kar Wai is not someone who has ever been profitable, let's say, or a uh, business-minded filmmaker. And I think... What makes his so impactful, even if they don't always have a financial gain for the investors in it, is that they leave a big impact on the people who watch these films. And I think that's why film as an art form matters, not just from its ability to entertain us, but to touch us on a deeper level and really move its audience and make them see things differently and make them look at their own life in a different way sometimes. And I think that's what makes filmmakers like Juan Kar Wai such a master of this craft and this art form and why I think Chung King Express is such a special film that I can't wait to talk about. But Oscar, what are your initial opening thoughts on Juan Kar Wai's 1994 masterpiece? Yeah. So this is, um, this is my second watch of this film and this is the second Juan Kar Wai that I've, uh, that I saw, but I've seen three now. I definitely need to get on more of that. But yeah, kind of you've kind of touched on parts. I think just across his films, he's kind of the master of not just love but color in general. I think um, that's what most impress it is what most impresses me across his films. Um, yeah, he kind of has that lack of uh, 
like kind of dialogue driven films and he focuses more on the visual storytelling which i think is most impressive but then again he kind of really hits us with um these character driven internal monologue things um uh, a lot of the time especially in chunking express and in uh, fallen angels as well but yeah he's just he's just so great at uh, portraying kind of the lost human almost someone who's kind of lost in life just going around their city life uh, especially in this and i think um that's uh that's one of the reasons why i love him so much is his sense of world building in a lot of his films is this really really stylish urban confined spaces that you just manage to fall in love with every single time um and this is uh just uh, this 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 is just shown night and day in chungking express and uh is upon rewatch i definitely i had this at a four and a half and it's still a four and a half for me but it's uh definitely raised it's gone up in my opinion it's getting close to that five star honestly but um yeah not not kind of a lot to say that's not already been said but such a such a great film on initial thoughts ryan yeah i'm pretty much in the exact same situation as you like i've only seen three one car y films um i started this year um just these two and in the mid for love but they are really unique films i think instantly they are just like so dreamy compared to the the usual films that you would you'd watch um and just diving into that kind of like introspect of two couples that it's not really a traditional romance that you would usually see in films like they just both long for intimacy with all the vibrant and chaotic backdrops of um that very like melancholic to hong kong like it's just so unique compared to anything else i've seen really and that really stands out one car wise style like it, I, I don't really know anywhere else that really can replicate what he does like he does stuff kind of emo or brings emotions that you can't really say with words and that really works where he's still, um, where there's not much dialogue, like Alex was saying. Um, and you both halves of Chongqing, Chongqing Express, like, really stand out. Um, obviously, shot, they were shot with two different cinematographers. Um, that was just down to scheduling conflicts, but, I mean, that really helped to make the two halves, like, really stand out from each other. Um, within both of them, there's really a strong emphasis, emph- emphasis on, like, time, um, like, clocks, expired food, um, end of relationships, even. And... I think the star of Chongqing really starts off well in that really like, frantic way with the, the low frame rate that I'm quite used to seeing Wong Kar Wai style. I've, I've not seen all these filmographies, so I don't know if it's a consistent thing without um, throughout all these films, but it's definitely a lot here, um, used a lot here. Um, and that kind of like fractured Ed thing at the start, the woman with the blonde hair, like it's really just kind of rushing through the streets of Hong Kong and almost interacts with a cop. And it's a, it's a very quite film noir start. Um, with the narration telling us that like he's gonna fall in love with this woman, um later on, um and just setting up that theme of like relationships that we're gonna see grow throughout the, the whole film as we see, um, it kind of reminded me of um past lives where like the interactions that we have with people, um we may not grow relationships with them or just people that we pass, but on the rewatch it just kind of reminded me of that. But yeah, Chunking, it's I think Chunking might be my favorite film from him as of now on the rewatch. Back to Alex. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think that In the Mood for Love is Wong Kar Wai's best movie, like technically speaking. I think it's so strong emotionally, and it's uh, it's just technically perfect on every single level, and such a mastery of his style. So I do think that is his best film. The Chung King Express is always going to be my favorite film from him, and it's a film, like I said, just because of the time I saw it in my life and personal connection to it it's the film that has always meant the most to me and it's always going to be my favorite film from him and like i said that first experience of seeing it where you know it's kind of just when you go to uh, with that first chapter it just you you kind of sit there with these uh kind of longing and uh downer type of emotions and then i feel like once you get to that second half you still feel them but the film with its more kind of lighthearted turn kind of then lifts you up together with the film you and the film kind of almost like the cycle of good and bad emotions where you kind of go in with the more sad feelings, then it lifts you up into a more positive feeling. And, you know, I started this, this year with three major goals myself, and I'm now at now being at the end of the year, very close to accomplishing all three of those. And I think I owe a lot of credit to, uh, of that to this film and just this film when I was, you know, not in as good of a place, just reshifting my mentality and re just igniting that love of cinema and 
making me realize, you know, what, what this is really all about and what my own goals are with this art form. And it's just, I think when you, when you watch this film from right away, it's such a fresh and unique artistic voice with no care for, you know, the conventions or the rules of cinema that we uh, talk about so much here in America. It's not always just trying to move the plot forward. And it's really uh, a very emotional experience. And it's all about what the characters are feeling. And it's, I think it's just a freeing experience, which I think if we go into what made Moncaro, I want to make this film, it's uh, it's very clear why it has the effect it does because, you know, he was working on Ashes of Time, which was his prior film, huge scale, big budget production, and had a bunch of, you know, different stars of Hong Kong at the time. And it took about two years and it was a two month break. He was pretty much mentally drained, unlike his spontaneous no script style that we're used to from Chung King, King Express. This was a film that was very carefully scripted, carefully planned out, almost more with like the Wes Anderson, Stanley Kubrick approach. And he was so drained from it that he had this two month break. So to prove to himself he still loved filmmaking, he made Chung King Express as a small project. And I think it, it ended up being way more successful in Ashes of Time and really defined the Wong Kar Wai style catapulted him into international success uh also we also all owe quentin tarantino for this film as well because he was the one who uh through his uh production company under miramax uh, acquired this film for an american distribution which helped car car Wai get uh international recognition and enough success to be able to fund future projects such as fallen angels and then eventually in the mood for love and you know, I think uh, he made it just with a love of filmmaking and creating and you know, trying new things, which is just such a freeing thing to see. And like I said, that first watch was a very emotional experience for me. And then I, uh, about six months later, I got to see it in theaters again. And that one greatly inspired me in a different way, where I was just, just from when I really watching the photography and the music of the film and realizing that it, it's such a gritty, street, on-the-go, low-budget film Yet it's breathtakingly beautiful at the same time, where a lot of times these grittier, low-budget films don't quite have, you know, the, the visual style and the beauty to them. But it's more about, you know, the heart behind them. Whereas this film has that heart and it has that, you know, on-the-go style, but it's still a very beautiful film to look at, which I think is very rare. And it, the second watch really made me realize the beauty that you can find in just the things around you. And... Juan Carwa is a very urban filmmaker, and I consider myself a very urban filmmaker as well. And the way he captures the city of Hong Kong with, you know, the motion blur and the, the chaotic nature of it, I think is uh, something I really connect with. Just how he seems to draw so much inspiration from his city and doing Ashes of Time, which was a very uh, in the desert, not an at home project. This was very much, you know, him coming home to an environment he was comfortable in in a, a setting in a world that he knew inside and out. And you really see that uh, come from him, how the city almost just flows through him as an artist, along with another uh, huge theme from Wong Kar Wai's entire career, which is this theme of time where he constantly shows you clocks, especially in his second film, Days of Being Wild. And there's, uh, he, there's always this emphasis on time. Like, for example, when... In the second chapter, when Fei Wong goes to California, the actual California, and they talk about, you know, the time zones between them, how uh, the first character is obsessed with, you know, the time passing between him and his breakup. And, you know, Wong Kar Wai, I think, is an artist who thinks a lot about his own mortality and, you know, the fact that we're not on this earth forever and making the most of that time. And, you know, time as the most expensive currency in the world, I think. He greatly understands as an artist, which we see so very much in this film and everything else he does. But I'll pass it off to Ryan. Mm, yeah, just like you were saying, the, that setting of Hong Kong, um, it's quite unique to me. I've not really seen much films like that, but it's such a, a great place for really setting the tone and kind of vibe of both these stories. Um, setting a really like crowded, fast-paced area um, where there's like it's flooded with interactions, um, but nobody really seems to be making much relationships or anything or really knowing each other and Wong Kar Wai really takes advantage of that and takes time to kind of isolate these two moments of time where these characters do grow real connections um within the chaos of this city and like it's really where there's um there's so many opportunities for um these themes to really grow in this um, environment um and it perfectly like juxtaposes like the relationship against this environment like um 
really distinguishing the the city between the two relationships. Like the first one's mainly set like during the nightlife. Um, it's filled with neon lights and kind of that melancholy atmosphere that he starts with. Um, whilst the second story, like Alex was saying, is kind of more like warm colors. It's it's more happy. It's set during the day. Um, and I think that really makes this half a much more like comforting watch. Um, but there's still that like really like hypnotizing like just vibe to both of them. They found throughout the whole film. Um. And even in the city, like kind of the the more exciting parts of the film, they kind of happen away from outside of the city, like in their apartments, like that long scene with Faye, um, with California, as a California dream. There's a song, um, there's a montage of really cleaning the apartment, um, that's probably my favorite scene in the film, and that's really where the soundtrack shines. Like the soundtrack is amazing in this film. Um, I had California Dreaming stuck in my head, um, the whole past week just playing it. Um, and he plays it about four or five times, but it's just straight dopamine every time he plays it, no matter what. Um, and Dreams is also great, which um, I noticed that he actually has a lot of like singers and artists as his actors in his films. Like Faye Young, if Faye Wong is the one that actually does cover Dreams by herself. So I thought it was interesting how a lot of the, the characters kind of had that like, musical background as well. Um, but yeah, going back to the, the first half, like that cop, um, like Alex was saying, it's all about dates, um, setting deadlines. Um, kind of sets deadlines for his grieving period of the end of his last relationship, like through the food of the um, the cans expiring. Um, and that kind of lasts over a couple of days. And they constantly remind you that, remind you of that with like the clock and passing. Um, and it really works towards that kind of like chaotic and decisive nature of both of those characters because they both make like quick decisions. Like the blonde woman, she's kind of in the horrible nightlife side of like Hong Kong where she's like killing people and she just randomly decides to kidnap a girl on a whim. And then he's also quite chaotic as well, just randomly showing up to a girl in the bar and the child up when he sees her across the bar. And it's just really the characters and the relationship really fit in with that like fast moving nature of Hong Kong setting. So I think it really worked for the first half. But yeah, what do you think, um, Oscar? Yeah, I think I have uh, quite a bit to say about the first half. I, I kind of just love the transition. I think I spotted this more kind of um, on a second watch, maybe because I'm just getting into film world, but just kind of that failed love story to the successful one in the um, in the second half of the film. Um, and I think there's just such a distinguishment between two half of the films. And the thing you said about the cinematography is fascinating because I was uh, about to say, um, oh, that's a really neat trick, but it being accidental is quite funny. Um, <laughs> But yeah, kind of uh, the representation of time, I think, is brilliant, especially in that first half. Is he uh, what Wong Kar Wai does? He's he's just so precise with everything that character that he does. Um, he talks about, uh, I think he says, um, "I wish my can uh, I wish cans would never expire." Um, kind of talking about that kind of love and uh, um, his breakup period that he's going through. He just he just he just feels that loneliness and it kind of that first half kind of reminds me of fallen angels almost kind of characters wandering about their life kind of um aimlessly almost um with kind of things that it impacted them because obviously the blonde woman as well um is in a kind of similar ordeal um but yeah um just overall um the first half i think is um just so brilliant um and I, I like kind of the use of character names how the cops are just kind of uh the first guy in the first half is either cop two three two two three which i think he's referred to most of the time or i think his name is ho chi mo i think but i think the cop in the second half and correct me if i'm wrong but i don't think he ever gets named i think it's just cop six six three yeah i think so um for the for the most of it and like the woman in the blonde wig that's that's all she's credited as as well um and then the only one who kind of is really named is Faye in the second half um but i think it's kind of really impressive to con to basically convey two different almost love stories in two different senses in the same film and kind of um that kind of short amount of of time for each half because i think the um one half is actually quite a bit longer than the other from uh, what I remember watching it. Um, um, but yeah, um, that's kind of my main thoughts on the uh, first half of the film. Alex? Yeah, I, uh, I want to talk a little more about, you know, how Wong Kar Wai is able to create that heartbreak on such a level that I don't think... Uh, many other filmmakers are capable of, you know, the, the market's flooded with, you know, romantic comedies and 
films that kind of tackle uh, emotions such as heartbreak, but I don't think they none of them really have that punch to them that Juan Carwai is able to create. And I think uh, to start off, it's just the way he uses voiceover in an inner monologue, which you know you could talk about as a low budget, resourceful technique that he used. But at the same time, I think it really is what captures uh, the the nature of the film so much is how the most of the most important lines of dialogue in the film are said in voiceover. Most of the truest and realest feelings of the characters are said in voiceover, and I think the characters talk a lot more to themselves than they do other people, which really captures that isolation and loneliness. Juan Kar Wai, I think part of why his style is so unique is that he doesn't really uh, draw his influence much from uh, Western films, he says, like the American films. Whereas more so Eastern films, uh, such as, you know, a lot of Asian cinema and uh, some European cinema. He talks about, you know, Godard, Antonioni, but the one American artist he speaks very highly of is Martin Scorsese. And you definitely see that here with like Taxi Driver and this, this urban loneliness, this loneliness in a very crowded and full world with things like in the second chapter where, you know, uh, the characters the are the characters we follow will be moving very slowly while the rest of the world is like time lapse moving quick around them just to create that level of isolation in this fast and chaotic hong kong environment and i think you know a, a lot of what the voiceover is is ideas and deep questions deep observations and characters who are always really thinking very deeply as they're they're feeling these heightened emotions and of course, the music, which I'll talk a little more about later in depth, is is such a big part of how he's able to create this. But also, he's big on you know the way his actors move and the movements of them, along with the rhythm of the music and the lighting, which creates a certain mood to it. All is is what really what adds this emotional punch. You really feel the emotional pain of the characters, especially in uh, the first chapter, I think, and a lot of that comes from the voiceover and. One thing that's worth noting is that there's never really this a sense of any anger uh, towards the significant others who have left the characters, whichever chapter of the film that we're in. There's never really an anger. It's more of a longing and uh, a sadness to it, which I think adds another uh, layer to it from the more standard approach we'd see, which is more through anger, whereas it's more of a disappointment, I think, in the way Wan Kar Wai approaches it. And, you know, uh, he's a filmmaker who understands that love is not a clear and simple emotion. And I think this film per perfectly reflects that, where it's not a very clear film. It's not a clear narrative. And even just the way it looks with his iconic Juan Car Wai slow motion, it's the motion is very blurred. And it's blurry and you can't always see everything. And I think that perfectly reflects the emotion and the, the feelings he wants to convey in this film. With, with emotions that are not easy and complex to understand for us as the audience or for the characters within the film who they don't even fully understand the way they feel or why they're feeling the way they do. But also, there's uh, he talks, Juan Carwise even said himself that his characters are often searching for something, for something to keep themselves from their loneliness and uh, characters who find themselves in solitude and are yearning for a replacement for the love that they feel, which is pretty much the arc of both of these chapters, along with Fallen Angels as well. And Wong said that what makes this film different from uh, Days of Being Wild and As Tears Go By is that in this one, it's the characters who accept their loneliness. And I think especially in that first part, it's not just the emotion of love, but there's an unreciprocated love. And... Uh, the way he deals with, you know, a love that's very one way rather than the romantic comedy thing of, you know, two people who were in love and have their flaws uh, or have their conflicts between each other. Uh, the, at least the, the part one chapter of Chunking Express is really explores this kind of unreciprocated love where the other person either doesn't care or they moved on. We never know because we, ne we never see the other person. We only are isolated to this one character's perspective on it. And I love the the whole expiration date motif. I think it's such a strong and powerful motif that I actually uh, use that quote a lot in life. Just the idea of everything has an expiration date, I think, is uh, a, certainly a truth of life. It's a truth that a lot of us don't want to admit is true. And obviously, we all know the ultimate expiration date is that one day we're no longer going to be 
breathing on this earth. And like I said, with Juan Carwai's uh, emphasis on time in all of his films, he's very understanding of this. And just another way that the film captures heartbreak so well is the way the film cries where the characters in the film themselves never cry. Instead, you know, Ryan talked about how it has this dreamy quality to it. And it's the film and the world around them in the city that instead cries through the rain. Like when uh, the second character is heating up the letter that he couldn't read and it's just the wet, rainy uh, texture drips down the glass. Or, you know, when uh, they just show the sign of California, the, the restaurant they were supposed to meet and how she instead goes to the real California just the way the, the rain slowly drips down that sign or when Faye's sitting there thinking and you have the rain dripping down in slow motion. And I just think it's beautifully uh, poetic through through cinema, which is moving images, which is the core of what this art form is, is moving images and just the way the film cries purely through moving images rather than the characters themselves crying or uh, talking about how they're they're feeling as much as just the way the film expresses that emotion through its visuals, I think is one of the most uh, beautifully poetic elements of Juan Carwai's storytelling. I'll pass it off to Oscar. Yeah, the, you made some amazing points there. I think kind of going on from that kind of expiration day thing, I think it's, um, there's kind of almost a transition point that I think is uh, quite brilliant. Um, uh, Ho Chi Mo uh, says at one point, uh, my closest point of intimacy I was uh, one centimeter one centimeter away, and six hours later, she fell in she fell in love with another man. Um, just kind of adding to that um, sense of exploration, how he's kind of always thinking ahead, and he's always got that like um, impending sense of kind of doom on his life. And I think at that point, it kind of hands over to the second half of the film, um, where we see um, six six three come in, um, who in comparison to um, Ho Chi Mo, uh, Cop 2D3 is kind of a very uniformed officer um, compared to kind of the underworld setting of the first half where um, Ho Chi Mo is kind of this almost, he looks like a, like a cop in disguise basically or kind of undercover almost. Um, he hasn't got uniform on at all and um, I think it's a really, really great, a great contrast, a visual contrast between those two halves of the film. Um, and another contrast I thought is uh, really, really clever. Um, uh, in the first half, um, uh, Ho Chi Mo says that um, he'll remember all of his life when a woman said happy birthday to him, kind of treasuring on to that and holding on to that, that uh, kind of loneliness that um, Alex was adding to. I think it's just is so special and it's quite sad almost. But um, I think it's quite funny that he uses a uh, pineapple as the fruit as well. I think I, I kind of want to know the specific choice around cans of pineapple. But I think, again, that's a really, really clever um and then um, in the second half of the film, I uh, can't remember which ex exactly scene it is, but um, uh, someone says to Cop 663, I think it's after um, he's had that uh, like uh, kind of fling with the air hostess, and it says, uh, he, someone says to him, no need to be sad, try another girl, um, which is kind of exactly what um, uh, Ho Chi Mo kind of wouldn't want to hear, even though it's not directed towards him, it's directed towards... Um, uh um 663 um but yeah i think the use of kind of not yeah the visual kind of contrast between the two halves of the film i think is just done so so well and that just is not uh, even if uh, it's a nod to um one car wiser director and even if it was a the accidental kind of cinematographer change it's almost like task fail successfully because i think that's absolutely brilliant honestly um and it makes it kind of stand out so much um and yeah, I just think it's absolutely brilliant. But yeah, hand off to you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, the pineapples is funny. I don't, I don't really understand why it's pineapples. It's funny that he uses it in Fallen Angels as well with the mute. He just eats a bunch of pineapples when he's young, and that's like the, the re only reason we get to why he, he like doesn't talk. Um, but it's just funny that he brings that back up again. Um, but yeah, just like you were saying, like there's just such a big like contrast between the two halves. Um, that like Fay and Cop half, um, Cop two six. I don't remember his name. Um, six six three. I think it is. Yeah, I wish I, yeah. I wish I gave him names, but um, mm, I think it's clever that he uh, he doesn't. I think it's quite suppose, wise yeah. actually. Um, but yeah, there's just a lot of time taken in this half to kind of slow down and kind of repetitively, repetitively like show the monotonous nature of like their just daily lives, 
like there's a bunch of um scenes where they're just eating or you see fade in or like work um it's just very slow compared to the first half that's quite frantic in the city um and we see the cop um he's not quite over his past girlfriend that broke up with him on april fool's day um and then him and Faye clearly like getting this relationship where they both like each other but they're kind of afraid to confess it or they they're kind of run out of time eventually to confess that which is really sad part in the movie um and throughout the whole thing he's kind of aware of what she's kind of doing in his apartment um she's constantly just coming in and almost pulling pranks on him like hiding when he comes in like changing the food in his cans um just cleaning about but they never really come and meet and actually confess their their feelings um and the film does a good job of kind of just expressing these emotions in a way that like you couldn't really do through words um um, and so, like Alex was saying about the kind of slowed down, um, like those like some of the best shots in the film are like when he places emphasis on like a a character on like the foreground or the background, and the world around them has kind of this like low frame rate like sped up effect, and it kind of just makes it look like it's their own moment in time, um, whilst the world around them kind of like passes, um, but yeah, it's just a really cool effect, um, that has a lot of meaning behind it. It's definitely some of my favorite shots in the film um and yeah and there's not really much connection between the sides as well um which is interesting we just have that kind of point in the middle where Faye gets the the giant garfield um toy and she kind of walks past the the blonde woman that's all about the kind of meeting points we get in the film um of course fallen angels was supposed to be part of chongqing express it's kind of like a fudge story um but one yeah because the 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 main like one of the characters Ho Chi Mo same actor same character yeah, name in like Fallen Angels as well yeah mm. um but yeah the film was just getting a bit too bloated so he made it obviously Fallen Angels um yeah the killer I think I think the killer story would have worked well but yeah um kind of showing again that different sides of Hong Kong because it was more about the nightlife um once again um but yeah I think it was a good decision to split them up um. Yeah, and the two independent stories is cool. Um, I would maybe like some more overlap between the two, um, like they do in Fallen Angels, because I do really like that um, aspect of the movie. Um, I do prefer the second half. I think the second half is like five out of five, but the first half just kind of doesn't have that like satisfying ending, I think. It kind of stops it from being a, a full five out of five. Um, but yeah, I know, I know obviously he'd done that on purpose. Um, kind of splitting them up and not having them interact and obviously there's a lot of like emphasis on atmosphere and emotions but like I think that doesn't have that like conclu- a satisfying conclusion to kind of like the story of the first half like the second does so it kind of just held it back a slightly bit just yeah but I think that's a really good part in Fallen Angels that it kind of connects them together but yeah back to you Alex Yeah, so I'm sure everyone's sick of hearing me say it, but top three most important things in film. Number one, music. Number two, music. Number three, music. And I can't talk about a Juan Car Wai film without saying that because I think if there's any filmmaker who agrees with me on that, it's Juan Car Wai. And I don't think any director puts as much importance on music of his films as Juan Car Wai does, who uh, you may or may not know that he's someone who shoots without scripts. And I do think he's a great writer, and I think even though he writes most of his scenes the morning before he shoots them, I think there's still such a great and spontaneous quality that comes from that. I know some people like to criticize that because his films don't always have a a concrete plot, as if that's all screenwriting is. But I think the real script of his film is always the music. He, He doesn't have a script going into it, but he always has his music ready, playing music on set. And he knows that music is the real communal language of the world. And... If you want to be someone from Hong Kong and making someone in the middle of America feel emotion, the best and most effective way to do that is music or vice versa. If you're American uh, screening something for a Hong Kong audience, it's the music is the communal language of the world. And I've I've always felt it's where most of the emotion and film really drives from. And I think he, because he cares so deeply about his music, which is why people all over the world can feel such strong emotions from uh, this low budget Hong Kong film. And uh, I think he, he talks a lot about the rhythm of it. And he finds the rhythm of the scene through the music, which is 
how everything moves and the mood of the 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 scene really comes from the music that's playing but of course uh also of course at a very high volume uh like uh, i think Faye says in the part two how she plays it loud so it's so loud that you can't even think and just kind of almost music just flows through you and you kind of just uh uh, the way it guide can guide your mood and the way you feel. And he's also famous for repeating music in his films and using the same songs over and over again. Uh, of course, most notably California Dreamin', which I know Ryan mentioned. And it is, uh, and it, of course, great song. And it's almost like even though you hear the songs over and over again, like once you hear California Dreamin', like you want to hear it again, you want it to come on again. Same for pretty much all the other pieces of music, like What a Difference a Day Makes, uh, Things in Life, and uh, one that Fei Wong sings. And there's just so many uh, great pieces of music that we get to hear multiple times. The same way I'm sure everyone listening to this has a favorite song that they've listened to on repeat over and over again, like people do. And I think Wong Kar Wai understands that you can't, like, why can't you use a piece of music more than once? Like, why does it always have to be a one off thing? And he always shows you the source of the music as well with in part one, there being like the way the light kind of flares on the CDs as they spin creates like almost like a holy imagery of the jukebox. And it's just treated with such a grand presence to it and a grand importance. And then of course the very final shot of the film is the CD player where California Dreamin' was played. And just that with the reflection, which he uses reflections a lot as well, which I'll talk about in a bit, but uh, way that the the importance of the source of the music is always treated with as a uh, as this very important image of the film because uh, music like i said is the real script of i think the films i make the films Juan car y makes and it's where a lot of the emotion comes from and i think why this film has such a strong emotional punch with audiences all over the world despite being a very culturally specific film and not one where it simplified the film and made it as simple and easy to understand to attract a, ma a mass audience. It's, you know, this is a film that's very specific and very culturally specific, yet it's still able to have such a, an effect on such a wide audience. And I think the music is a huge part of that, but I'll pass it off to Ryan. Yeah, um, I've not seen much Hong Kong cinema, but I think it really made that stand out because I think it tends to be around that time. It used to be a lot of like quite action or big, big set piece action films, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so I think, like you said, that really did help make it to reach it to an American audience. I'm um, just having this amazing soundtrack because it, it is so good. Um, especially California Dreaming, like that even works towards her character as well. Obviously, she wants to, or she ends up going to California at the end. Um, so it just really works well, or works so well within the characters as well. But it, it's such a good soundtrack. But yeah, I don't have much else to add with that, Oscar. Yeah, I don't really have much to add um, either to that, honestly. I think Alex kind of sums it all up perfectly. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, before we move into Fallen Angels, there's uh, a couple things in terms of the filmmaking I think uh, we should give, give some praise to because his filmmaking is incredible and his spontaneous, unique style, which, you know, I'm someone I hate handheld cinematography. Like, I really don't like the way it looks. I don't like the shakiness to it. I like movements that are typically more fluid, like a Fellini film, or you know, strong static compositions, like something you'd see from Stanley Kubrick, for example. I really don't like uh, kind of the shakiness to handheld. And Juan Carwai is someone who is can make a film that's almost all handheld, and I can look at it and say that is one of those beautiful visual films I've ever seen. And it, it definitely makes me question, you know, how handheld can be used in film. And I think it's a remarkable accomplishment that he makes a film that looks this good uh, using that format of cinematography. Also, of course, the reflections are super iconic to this film. Typically, like a 50-50 split where half the frame will be uh, the subject, such as, for example, Fei Wong going up the escalator and the other half being the reflection. Typically reflected not just by a mirror, but something that something in the environment, like an escalator or, or glass somewhere. Another example being when uh, Tony Leong's character, who's the in part two, uh, Cop 663, I think it is, and he's looking out the window as his ex-girlfriend rides off, and you see them through the glass, but also on top of his reflection. 
And of course, the final shot being the music source, like I talked about, and a reflection. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the reflections can be interpreted so many different ways. But I think, you know, the film that deals with isolated, lonely characters who are talking to themselves, I think, is why it's so important to have so many reflection shots such as these, is at least the way I interpret it. And then, of course, like I said, he has a lot of influence from Scorsese. So use of freeze frames typically here to kind of freeze a chaotic moment where two people two people are very close to each other. And then foreshadowing that there will be some form of uh, romantic or love connection between them by the end of the chapter. And then, you know, the min minimizing sync dialogue is a good low budget technique as well that he does. I think the voiceover is not just a resourceful artistic choice, but one that actually is important to the storytelling itself. And also, if you notice, the characters are often leaning on things. There's in a bunch of different scenes, like uh, 663, when he's sitting at, uh, at home and he just has his head leaned back, or the bar scene of uh, uh, the first cop and the, uh, the hit woman in the blonde wig, where they're kind of leaning on each other. It's almost like, like I said, how he creates the mood of, of heartbreak, where there's this like heavy weight quality to the film, where world just feels so heavy on top of the characters where they're almost just drained of energy and they just always are leaning on things because it feels like they're just so drained emotionally i just think that visually from the actors helps really convey that mood he also uses great use of textures different uh, glasses to kind of create certain textures I talked about water and how the film cries i actually forgot to mention in part one how uh, the first cop, he runs as a way to sweat the tears out of his body rather than cry himself, which is another way that, you know, the film and the characters cry in ways that are not tears. Uh, Juan Carvai also is great at using the edges of the frame and just shapes and Dutch angles he uses beautifully. And, you know, I think uh, just also part one just is very much, I feel like, about true loneliness and isolation, whereas... I think part two is more kind of daydreaming and, you know, dreaming with with that airplane motif and just these, this idea of, you know, dreaming about other people and a better life and dreaming about a life with someone, I think is really what uh, the core of part two is. And I just think they both uh, complement different areas of this emotion so beautifully. And why it's, I think, one of the most emotionally powerful films ever made. But Oscar, do you have anything, any... Uh, other thoughts on Chunking Express? Uh, no, I think uh, you've kind of done a good job of wrapping up everything. I think it's California Dreaming. It kind of speaks for itself. That song, the title, just beautifully sums up the film, and it's used so many times. But every single time it comes on, it's it's so good. It doesn't it doesn't like tire. I don't tire of hearing it in that film, which is um, surprising. But it's uh, such a good song. Mm. Yeah, there's just such a great contrast between both halves, um, kind of the nightlife and the day. It's just, it, it's so good. I love Chunking Express, but yeah, kind of ready to go into its counterpart, Fallen Angels now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, so... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, all good. Um, so... Yeah, so of course, after so originally, Juan Kar Wai typically starts his process with kind of having three short stories. And so this was supposed to be a three-part story, Chungking Express, but he's not someone, unlike myself, one thing me and him really differ on is he does not like long three-hour movies. He likes to keep them as close to a 90-minute runtime as possible. And he didn't want uh, the film to go any longer with Chungking Express also already being an hour and 40. So he made the third part, which was a, more of a crime gangster uh, take on heartbreak and love. And... I made that into Fallen Angels and instead made it really like a mirror and an opposite of Chungking Express, where you see a lot of callbacks and references to it, but with a much darker and new mood to it. And I talked about how uh, Chungking Express is a movie where I just saw it for the first time. It was just as perfect as can be. It was the right time in my life. Seeing it on the big screen in the theater and uh, Fallen Angels, I did not get that experience at all. On Angels, the first time I saw it was, I was so, uh, after Chunking Express, I just wanted to watch everything that Juan Car Wai did and was just binging through his filmography. And I was so excited to watch Fallen Angels. Yeah, I watched it like a week later and it was one that 
no, I, I didn't want to watch it during the day. It needed to be nighttime, no competing sounds. Like I, I wanted the as good of a home experience as I possibly could for it. And I, I waited for everyone else to fall asleep so that no one else would have, you know, a TV on or any competing sounds. And unfortunately I was just so tired by the second half of this film. I was fighting sleep more than I was paying attention to the movie and really experiencing it. I also couldn't keep the volume very high, so I felt no immersion into the music the way that I did with, you know, California Dreaming and Things in Life and all those songs of Chunking Express. So I gave it like a four star on a first watch, and I was kind of disappointed because there was such a, a hype for it. But once I got to see this film in theaters, I was completely blown away getting to see it in a real experience for the first time. And it's it's not it's even more abstract than Chunking Expresses. And is such a kind of a movie that's more you're supposed to just feel the movie rather than understand it and just go through feeling with the rhythm and the lights and the aesthetic and all everything that creates rather than, you know, kind of trying to follow the plot and figure things out or guess the ending or look for a plot twist. This Fallen Angels is not that kind of movie. It's a movie that's very much just meant to the same way you look at a painting and are going to feel something. Is very much what Chunking expresses, only it's a painting that moves and has uh, music and a rhythm to it. And I recommend anyone to just kind of go through and just feel the movie and what uh, feelings it creates for you. But, Ryan, what are your thoughts on Fallen Angels, Juan Car Wise follow-up? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Fallen Angels was my favorite for quite a long time from Wong Kar Wai. Um, it's probably Chunking after the recent rewatch, but yeah, it's... Very much a, a spiritual sequel to Chunking, um, like you were saying. Um, once again, painting a kind of like dreamlike and romantic portrayal of that like Hong Kong setting again, except this time it's instead of telling that whimsical side of the the love in Chunking Express, it tells a more like negative view of heartbreak and love, uh, kind of dividing more into that darker side, the underground um side of Hong Kong. Um, also the the first half we decide to follow the killer, exploring the kind of idea shown in the. The first half of Chunking Express with the the woman in the blonde wig, although this time he's kind of flipping the sides of it. Um, this time it's a man that's the assassin, it, it, it and it does stand out from Chunking um in this manner not only from the romantic side but we also get a lot more chaotic shootout scenes and just more of the grungy side of Hong Kong's nightlife. So it, it really stands out with that kind of opposite of Chunking. Um, it, it it does borrow a lot of um stylistic choices from Chunking. That are kind of a staple to Wong Kar Wai's style, like the the low frame rate variations and handheld a lot of handheld um close ups like you were talking about earlier with Chung King, and the neon illumination of the city just makes it such a beautiful like film um throughout, and he adds a lot of close up um wide angle lens shots um with the handheld, which really makes it really intimate with the characters, really adding to that sense of isolation in the city. Um, once again, um, and it really adds that distinct style to Fallen Angels for me. Um, there isn't really anything that I can compare it to, really. The Hong Kong settings look so cramped and congested like Chongqing, but the, the way they shoot the characters really feel far away, even though they're right next to each other, and that wide-angle lens really makes it so unique, the way it's shot, and helps towards pushing the characters away from each other, and it's it's just the stuff that kind of makes a, a Wong Kar Wai picture really unique like this. But yeah, that's... I really love Fallen Angels as well. But what about you, Oscar? Yeah, this is for me. This is out of the three I've seen. This is definitely my favorite. Maybe it's because I'm kind of uh, a sucker from slightly more experimental filmmaking, and that this absolutely falls into the trap of those three the most. Um, and I think it's it's just cinematic genius. Honestly, again, kind of we see this uh, mastery of color with like exaggerated neon lighting. It, it's almost futuristic, like really, which I think is um it, it just looks beautiful yeah, it's um, like a sci-fi film at times it does it does look like it um he obviously gets more experimental with this one kind of with his style and camera work he kind of is used a lot more often and he kind of turns up the dial uh like ryan you were saying the wide angle lenses work i think they work wonders brilliantly and that's kind of contrasted with these kind of long length shots uh that add a lot of depth to it um especially in kind of We'll probably go into a bit later, but uh, that kind of famous uh, motorbike scene, which is probably one of my favorite scenes ever, that just the shot, uh, the depth that scene has to it and kind of the escapism of that feel of kind of a tunnel and a motorbike kind of getting away almost from that um, that kind of urban uh, world building that he's uh, so famous for. 
Um, again, kind of we see this um, internal monologue used um, uh, like Chunking Express across our characters with minimal dialogue uh, spoken. And it's just one of those films uh, like kind of the first half of Chunking, similarly kind of just about life playing out and just about characters and each of their hopes and desires. And I just think it, it just works so, so well. Um, I know this is definitely his most polarizing film from what I've seen. I see a lot of people rate this film negatively. I can see why, because it could, it kind of just flows along for a lot of people, I guess. But uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful film for me. Back to you, Alex. Yeah, I agree. It, it's certainly a more abstract approach, but I think there's such a, such powerful emotions that it, it's able to convey through its imagery. You know, I love film noir, and I really don't like neo-noir, and this is one of those that's an exception, like Blade Runner 2049, and Batman, because of how it's able to use uh, colored lights in such a strong way. And I think it's just, it, it's a beautiful aesthetic he creates, and like I said, the, going back to the rhythm and the music... I think it's so strong like there's such a strong rhythm to the music it's not a lot of music like california dreaming that you're probably going to go listen to on your own time but i think it's super effective for the mood that he wants to create in this this underground world and i think he builds off of the trend with this underground world of humanizing gangsters that we have seen in uh the recent scorsese films and tarantino films which really made the gangsters like real fleshed out people rather than just like the typical, you know, dumb bad guys. And we see things like, you know, uh, that they have like real past, like when he's on the bus and he runs into someone he went to school with who has no idea what he does. And he's just like, ah, oh, like, you know, he's trying to sell him insurance, I think it was. And just the way, uh, and like the other character, how like uh, his love for ice cream and just the way that there's in like the relationship he has with his father and just making them, you know, real human people with real conflicts, real memories and like things like, you know, what is a what does a, a hitman do when he gets home from work? And it's like how he needs to, you know, deal with his wounds and all that. But it's like he's like anyone else just getting home from a day of work the same way. And he really, uh, I think, does a great job of humanizing the the characters in this underworld. Uh, on kind of like what we see Tarantino and Scorsese do, but he gives it his kind of his fresh approach to it. And of course, I love the uh, the the fisheye lenses that we've talked about. Where he said the the main thing he liked about them is how they they make the characters appear close when there really is a great distance between them, which is the core of the relationships of this film, especially the hitman and his assistant, where they have this you know kind of close working relationship, but. It's not the relationship that uh, they want it to be. And I think just this uh, kind of going back to what we see in part one of Chunking Express with this unreciprocated love, but also we see a, a great imagination from the characters where it kind of combines that that unreciprocated love from part one with kind of the, the dreaming of a life with the person that we see in part two of Chunking Express. And it kind of molds them together in this film to create a, a more pessimistic result where uh, neither lives up to the, it doesn't live up to the imagination that the characters hope for, and it, it just continues to go unreciprocated. And I think the hitman as a career for the character also is fitting because it's a job that requires you to be emotionless to a degree. And I think the the real theme of Fallen Angels is characters who are fighting their emotions and they're fighting to not feel these these emotions. And I think that all just blends in perfectly with the the more pessimistic mood to on Angels compared to Chunking Express. But I'll pass it off to Oscar. Yeah, I've kind of gone over my main points, but I've just got um, just uh, things to add kind of going off what you were saying. I think that kind of fisheye lens that we see in this, I, I love to bit. And I think it's just a saying that we hardly see ever now, which is why I love Yorgos Lanthimos so much, because he's kind of the guy bringing it back at the moment, um, especially in Poor Things, It Works a Treat. Um, but yeah, I, I love that shot type so much. Kind of that depth adds that kind of disconnected nature from life. And I think um, that just expresses that so, so well. It's kind of within reach, but in reality, it's actually a lot further away than you think it is. Um, but yeah, just as a whole, is kind of his mise-en-scene of the whole setting of um, Hong Kong is just brilliant. Kind of there's a lot of empty uh, shops and places, but it's got this really cramped atmosphere to it. Like 
all his kind of um all his uh the majority of his kind of main three films do and i'm sure a lot of his other films do which i haven't actually seen yet um but i think there's that uh there's kind of this focus on kind of female characters and kind of the costumes and the makeup and the way they look in this film especially with um uh blondie um and i think that kind of works uh really really well in kind of yeah just pretend this uh kind of oh what's the word i'm looking for oh um femme fatale style that um that she has around her and i think that um that kind of uh fish eye lens and the um, those long length shots that add depth really kind of add uh and emphasize kind of what they're what uh Wong Kar was going for with kind of the it can almost slightly exaggerated um style of kind of makeup and costume but yeah on to you ryan have you got any more thoughts yeah. on uh fallen angels no i'm glad to hear that yorgos is using the fish eyed lens again because it was so good in the favorite is such a great technique that isn't really used a lot or we don't really see it used that much anymore um but yeah just going back to fallen angels um kind of bringing over that kind of hong kong as a character side of the film um like he did in chung king um it works so great in this film as well um like once again kind of the there's so many interactions throughout the movie um but they don't really form any solid relationships um like the the first story we have the killer um he's definitely not a good guy um he's a killer um he shoots up barber shops by accident and sort of the butchers at one of the scenes and he doesn't really seem to care he's kind of numb to everything at that point um and that kind of goes again with what alex was saying in his relationships he doesn't really have anybody in his life um that he cares about um, meanwhile he has that kind of um the agent that sends him on these missions that she's kind of formed a, a parasocial relationship with him she's fell in love without i fell in love with him but they've not really reciprocated it to each other um he doesn't even really know about it i don't think um that much but she has a really strong kind of love for him already without them having that many interactions with each other um and that's kind of mixed in with the, the other relationship between ho chi Minh and um, charlie um, giving the kind of more comedic side to this like dark nightlife of the the Hong Kong city, and it's he's quite a dopey character. Um, so it's a lot a lot of where the comedy comes from. Um, but he's also in a, a really complicated relationship at the start when we meet him. Um, kind of brings back that idea of expiry dates for the relationships from Chung King. Um, he's waiting on Charlie to kind of get over her boyfriend where they go to see um Ruth Hullet in the the football game. Um, and then he finally admits that she's not going to go over that um, past relationship, that he was kind of just tagging along and she was trying to find her old boyfriend. Um, but yeah, just once again, back into that idea about like time and expiry dates um, that he talked about in Chongqing. Um, I really love how the, the stories are quite connected in this as well. Um, at the end, um, we have that scene with the, the agent and Ichimo um, in the, ro- the restaurant. Um, yeah, no, 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 him and Charlie, and they're discussing the 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 blonde, um, blonde, um, that the killer's been sleeping with, um, and they kind of realise that the the cat in front of him is called called blonde, and it just creates this like chaotic fight in the restaurant. That's just like, really another another great moment in the film, but it's just kind of those like small connections between the stories that kind of I don't know. I, I appreciated that compared to the the side of Chung King, um, but yeah, um, back to you, Alex. Yeah, I agree. I also love those those small connections in the story, and I think they do a great job of, you know, because I think the core of what makes it so interesting is, like I said, this urban element of, like, how many people are, you, you're around every day, but there's still this loneliness, and, like, you don't know other people around you story, kind of like back, going back to Chung King, how the, in that first chapter, him and the hit woman, like, he has no idea that she told the guy the next day, like, he's celebrating that she wished him a happy birthday, meanwhile, she's She's killing a guy as he's, you know, uh, dreaming about her. And just the the irony of, like, and, like, us as the audience don't know the truth of what happened in his prior relationship. And just the, this not knowing an irony of all the people around you in this busy city, I think, is a core part of both of these stories. And, you know, I think uh, this is also one where we really see uh, Wong Kar Wai start perfecting his use of color that... Is very iconic and in the mood for love, but I think, you know, Chung King Express is, is a beautiful film. I wouldn't say it's necessarily his best use of color, and I think this is the film where he really started perfecting that part of his style. 
in his use of colors. I mean, it's it, obviously there's some beautiful color use in Ashes of Time as well, but I just think that, that neon, neo-noir color that he uses here is, is perfect. And you also see, uh, like, of course, the, the core of both of these is the, the loneliness of the characters. And here, Wong Kar Wai kind of gives uh, a personal connection to, I think it was the Hitman character uh, from his own life, where I think the loneliness in his films really stems from where as a kid, he was from Shanghai and then is moved to British Hong Kong when he was five. And because of the language barrier that uh, growing up for him created a lot of uh, isolation compared to all the other kids he was around, not speaking the same language. And uh, I think it seems to be, it's something he mentions frequently and seems to be a core of where the loneliness in his films come from, comes from being a, a child who didn't speak the same language and kind of this, this busy Hong Kong city uh, surrounded by people, but being different yourself at the same time. And this finding, like you said, finding themselves in solitude and finding things to escape their loneliness, which is the core of every single story in these two films is finding something to kind of escape that loneliness. And here it's, uh, we kind of see this as the fallen angels, as the two journeys to people crossing paths with the assistant and the, uh, the character with the motorcycle, the, I forget, I forget the character, the mute and, uh, the, the kind of path to them. It, it's the two, what was going on in their lives before they met, and then they meet and they're kind of this uh, replacement for each other. They're both kind of replacing at longing in their own lives. And of course, the very night in the Unawar film, and they're going through this tunnel and they come out and the very final shot, they go up and it's the morning sky, like day and good times are coming. So for as pessimistic of a film as this is, it actually subtly does have a more positive ending, I think, which is uh, for someone who makes you feel so much emotional pain as Juan Car Wai, always does kind of leave you with it, an uplifting feeling. Like I talked about with Chunking Express, it's he kind of really, you feel that heartbreak with him and you go through this uh, this emotional pain through his films. And then the film and you together kind of lift up out of it together and uh, leaves you, has you leaving the theater uh, kind of ready to move on and uh, with a more optimistic outlook compared to the kind of intense... Uh, emotional pain that he makes you feel in the earlier parts of these two films. But Oscar and Ryan, do you guys have anything else uh, on Fallen Angels? Um, just wanted to say there's one of the greatest endings ever, honestly, without a doubt. Yeah, it just definitely is. The, it, even between kind of this and Chunking Express, it's kind of almost. Uh, I remember Damien Chazelle, kind of his approach to an ending is kind of or just almost dialogueless. Uh, he said in an interview, it's just let the pictures talk for themselves. And I think that's what he kind of does brilliantly between this and Chunking Express, just giving that kind of last shot of visual storytelling, visual storytelling that just speaks a thousand words much, much better than dialogue. But yeah, it's, it's an incredible film. Mm. Yeah, just going back to kind of like the how it's a crossover again, once again, um, they're two characters of both experienced heartbreak um, throughout the film. Um, and they did meet each other quite a few times, um, but they never really found the moment where they both um, kind of felt right for both of them. And that's kind of drawn towards the, towards each other at the end after that like fight in the restaurant. Um, and of course we have that iconic more bike shot um, driving through the tunnel, like Alex was saying, like the daylight. Um, it's the, the first time you kind of see any daylight in the first film and that after sitting in darkness it's just hong kong the whole film but it's such a great ending and i actually stumbled upon a, an alternative ending i don't know if it was ever seriously considered but it's um they go to a gas station and i'm um, the kiss and then they end up not liking each other and um ho chi Minh just drives off which a really different ending um, i'm really glad it's not the the end i don't like that yeah no i don't like that much better as it is yeah, yeah it's much definitely better. one of the best endings be such a great film. And you see, like half the reviews on Letterboxd, like this film would have been a bit lower, but the ending kind of raised it up. Yeah. So it's even even if people, I know a lot of people aren't that big on this clearly because it's like I said before, it's kind of a bit of style stylistic overload. But I've kind of I think he was kind of the one of the filmmakers who started to get me uh, kind of around the fact that um, I was kind of 
I used to think like style over substance was a thing, but then you kind of get into one car one, and you just kind of realize this style is substance. And kind of, I definitely used to be like that originally when I got into film, and it's this year is definitely waned out. And I'm kind of, he's definitely kind of at the forefront of that. And even like, as much as I don't love him, like Wes Anderson, even almost is kind of like done, like, even though I don't love his style, obviously, but I think he's kind of got me around that as well. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, it's a style over substance is a, a overused and I think misunderstood criticism a lot where I think, uh, you know, Juan Carwise has a style because he's, it, that's his artistic voice and he's making it unique to him. It's not just, you know, he's not doing uh, these nice, beautiful shots to show off and it, it's always because there's a, a certain mood and emotion he wants to create and you know, it's it's like a painter. It's it's more about he wants to create a, a mood and a feeling from his audience, even if there's not a, necessarily a plot connected to it. It's uh, it's still about art. I think is really about the emotion it can create, and he's certainly a professional of that, which is why I think he's uh, such a great example of you know why uh, style and substance can go together. Mm. Yeah, between I, I think really between. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I think between Wong Kar Wai and Dario Argento, I don't think there's any filmmakers who are quite use color to their best of their abilities like those two. I think they're just unmatched in that area, honestly. Yeah. Kira Kurosawa. True. Yeah. Yeah. Ran. Different, different Ran. Yeah. yeah, true. But I think in kind of across like a whole filmography almost, especially Argento, um but yeah i think no one does it like them honestly and it's it's beautiful to see but uh sad that it kind of isn't necessarily the way now because i'd like color driven films i think are just the most beautiful thing ever mm. yeah i really hate that complaint about style over substance like you have all the these greats like chunking express fallen angels avatar 2 it's just all the greats and all the genres um that gets these complaints <laughs> Sneak, you sneak something in there. <laughs> really, really did. Got to keep bringing it up. James Cameron, the the king of style as substance. <laughs> Disappointed. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, like I said, it's it's really about uh, not not every. Uh, the only thing that a film needs to be is a moving picture and. Whether that wants to, you know, have a plot, whether that wants to tell you one cohesive story, whether it wants to tell you a bunch of smaller stories, or whether it just wants to create a certain feeling and emotion, it's all it all is value when done right and with an artist behind it who feels passionate about it, which is why I encourage people to, you know, when you watch a Wong Kar Wai movie, it's not going to be uh, the same thing that you're very used to, and it's going to be a very different style of experiencing a moving picture compared to what we're used to in America with, like I said, not a big emphasis on plot and a concrete narrative story. It's not like there's this mystery that you need to find out by the end of the film as much as it's just an experience and just kind of go with it and just let the images move you, see which images speak to you and just kind of see what feeling they, they can create when paired with on car wise music and, and rhythm the way it does, because I think uh, when you look at it that way, films like these can be very powerful and, you know, they might not speak to everyone. Like maybe there's an other artistic filmmakers who their style might speak to you more. But I think this is uh, a, an example of why we need to, you know, preserve films that might not be the most profitable and might not be the easiest to market because they can have such a strong and powerful effect on the audience. The way the Chunking Express has had on me and tons of others and, and many filmmakers such as Barry Jenkins, for example, who did Moonlight in 2016, cited as, you know, a big influence of theirs and uh, the way that their styles have uh, kind of grown and developed. So I, I really can't encourage people enough to watch these two films because they're two of the most incredible pieces of cinema, which could really expand your mind of what uh, this art form can be and the different ways that we can tell stories through it. Mm. I think it's kind of so sad as well. Like, uh, like me and like Ryan, I'm sure Ryan will back me up on this. Like, film like Fallen Angels, like digitally and physically, is impossible to find over here. There is literally only one way to watch this film over here. Um, 
uh, which is quite sad, but it's in, you can't rent it anywhere digitally. I think the only physical copy I've ever seen is in the, um, they do like a Criterion One Car Way collection over here, which is like 150 quid, which I really, really, really want to get. That's the only physical copy of Fallen Angels I've right ever here. seen in this country. Oh, do no. you actually? Nice. Yeah, I got I, the whole it, box set. Um, but luckily, That's I have great. a uni library, uh, which is amazing like old films like that um but i uh, which i can i've got like chunking express that's why i used to rewatch that but even like fallen angels is just it's so difficult to find in this country and i think um that's kind of it's kind of sad almost but i, I just really want to see just more of it because obviously it's kind of a bit bigger in america but i know there's things in america that are kind of harder to find than like things over here for example but yeah i think like distribution as a whole for, like those kind of films and you really need to get a turnaround honestly and uh, again, go watch yeah, it. Uh, wait, sorry, you have something else? I just said go watch it. Go watch oh, both yeah, these films. Uh, yeah, and like Oscar said, it's it, it is a problem to access to some of these films. But uh, you know, DM us if you are having trouble finding it. We'll help you find these films if you're looking to watch them. And thank you to Quentin Tarantino for getting this film dis- uh, distributed, at least in America, which. You know, if it, it probably would have been a financial failure otherwise, and we probably wouldn't have gotten a lot of the other great films of Wong Kar Wai. So thank you to him for this discovery. And uh, yeah, if you haven't seen this film, I highly encourage you to give it a chance. If maybe you watched it and didn't love it, I highly re- recommend rewatching it because it's one of the most beautiful pieces of art through cinema. And like always, like, subscribe, comment, all that other shit. And we'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you for tuning in.